Let's continue our conversation about weeds now with a special focus on a specific type of plant pest. And that is a type of plant we call invasive. Invasive species, invasive plants. What do we mean when we talk about invasive plants and how are invasive plants different from weeds? Well, let's take a look. Invasive plants are a special category of landscape weed. And invasive plants become problems not really in the garden, but outside of the garden walls. So we're talking about plants now that may have been introduced for horticultural purposes and then have become weeds out in nature and are harming the, the broader ecosystem in which they're planted. And so therefore preventing their spread becomes important. What makes a plant invasive? Well, when plants that evolved in one region of the globe are moved by humans to another region, a few of them flourish, crowding out native vegetation and the wildlife that feeds on it. And those plants that crowd out native vegetation and the wildlife that feed on it are invasive plants. Here we have an image of purple loose strife. It's a small perennial plant, herbaceous in nature, that grows in very wet soils right on the margins of freshwater ecosystems and is a broad ranging invasive species in North America. I share this example because it's a beautiful plant. It's quite stunning and may have been introduced or even encouraged due to uh, its ornamental qualities. However, it's escaped cultivation and it's now uh, displacing native species in important ecosystems throughout the United States. Some invasives can even change the ecosystem processes such as hydrology, fire regimes, and soil chemistry. So here I share an example of wild oats, Avena fatua. Wild oats are quite common in California. When you look out at the amber waves of grain, the golden hillsides, the grasslands throughout California, and you see in the summertime those brown hills, the rolling hills that are brown, maybe dotted with evergreen oak trees. The vast majority of that is uh, non-native grasses that were introduced during the ranching period of California's history. And really the entire ecosystem was converted uh, in, into one that was good for cows. Before that, most of the hillsides would be covered with some type of shrubland, a chaparral or a coastal sage scrub type habitat. And there's an issue with these annual grasses in particular in California, especially Southern California with its dry and fire prone climate. The chaparral has what we might call fire insurance. A lot of people think chaparral wants to burn. Well, not really, um, but when chaparral does burn in a fire, Many of the plants have certain survival strategies that allow them to regrow. And some plants will even have a flush of new growth after a fire. However, the fires in California that impact the chaparral, they're really uh, able to occur at a frequency of about every 30 to 100 years. And if the fire happens more frequently, then these fire adapted species, they don't make it. They can't re-sprout year after year. They need a period of regrowth so that they can uh, survive the next fire. So these are like once in a generation fires that the California ecosystem is really adapted to. However, the annual grasses 
They grow tall, they die in one year, and they leave behind very flammable fuel load. And because they're annual, they will re-sprout year after year. And they encourage or they increase the intensity and the likelihood of fires in an area that used to burn only once a generation, but now it can easily burn every year. And as humans spread out into the wild part of our state more and more, we increase the chances of wildfires. So if the avena, the wild oat, causes or encourages fires to become more frequent, over time what that will do is harm the native plants. And the grasses themselves don't even need to compete directly with the shrubs, but the fire regime has changed, the frequency of fire, and now what is encouraged is wild oat. You end up with some type of a feedback loop, a positive feedback loop that the more grass you have, the more fires you have, and the more fires you have, the more grass is further encouraged. So this is a type conversion of an ecosystem, and it's one of the really uh, impactful ways that invasive species can cause problems. And finally, invasive plants are defined as those species that have a competitive advantage because they are no longer controlled by their natural predators and can quickly spread out of control. Here we see eucalyptus trees on the left-hand side, and they look to be planted on the University of California, San Diego campus, or someplace similar to that. And eucalyptus trees are not native to San Diego. In fact, some species of eucalyptus are considered to be invasive. However, there's close to 700 species, and not all of them are problematic. One of the early eucalyptus that was planted in California is the blue gum eucalyptus. And that was introduced throughout the state for a number of reasons. It never ended up being as useful as anticipated and it ended up being quite problematic. One of the problems with eucalyptus is that they grow very quickly. And when they do so, they tend to lower the water table in the soil or they'll, they'll drain up or dry out soil. And in heavy rainfall areas, that's not a problem. But in Mediterranean climates and dry land ecosystems, that is an issue because uh, they will actually dehydrate the landscape. Furthermore, they display some characteristics in the soil where they exude chemicals through their roots that inhibit the growth of other plants. So eucalyptus favors more eucalyptus. So for a number of environmental reasons, they're somewhat problematic. Uh, additionally, people have concerns with their strength. They're a hazard for falling and breaking, and they're susceptible to fire. In the proper place, they're not always a problem, and many people associate California with eucalyptus trees now and lots of the aromatic leaves and the evergreen nature. And I admit, I enjoy a stroll through a eucalyptus grove myself. Uh, for example, on the UCSD campus, there's quite a few eucalyptus and they've been growing for many years to the point where they are quite naturalized and they behave somewhat as a wild forest would behave. You have people who love the eucalyptus, you have people who hate the eucalyptus. And either way, the eucalyptus did just fine for about 100 years in California without any predators. No local species would consume the eucalyptus and cause their population to be under control until the eucalyptus longhorn beetle, as you can see on the right-hand side, made an appearance in San Diego. Southern California in the late 80s and early 90s. And this beetle, all of a sudden, was made available to all of the eucalyptus that had no predators whatsoever. 
And as you can imagine, the beetle population began spreading rapidly. And now all of a sudden, some people are worried about the eucalyptus. Some people are happy that finally there's a predator. And either way, uh, it became a matter of concern. Should we act? Should we not act? And was the beetle introduced or did the beetle just arrive on its own accord? Lots of things to consider and lots of specific contexts to try to think about. Well, interestingly enough, uh, one form of biological control was implemented to bring about a natural predator of the eucalyptus longhorn beetle in the form of a parasitic wasp. This parasitic wasp targets only this beetle species. And so there was relatively no concern with introducing yet again another organism because it only needs to eat the beetles. So uh, a program was conducted to bring in parasitic wasps, natural predators of the eucalyptus longhorn beetle to try to bring the beetle population under control so that the eucalyptus population could continue to flourish. Now you may see many sides in this perspective and wonder to yourself, are the eucalyptus the invasive species? Are the beetles the invasive species? Or are the predators the invasive species? Or are the humans who introduced them in the first place the invasive species? Now that's a matter for interpretation, but I think it's an interesting situation to consider to recognize the fact that without a natural predator, any species has a competitive advantage. And species, especially plant species that have a competitive advantage and therefore grow rapidly to the detriment of native plants, those are plants we call invasive. So what's the current state of invasive species in California? Well, in California, approximately 3% of the plant species growing in the wild are considered invasive. That doesn't sound too bad until you realize that that's just a list of species. But if we look at the general proportion of the landscape, it's much more than 3% is covered by invasive species. And in general, California spends over $100 million each year on the removal of invasive species. And these, this is money spent by lots of different groups, by government agencies, by land managers of many types, um, nonprofit organizations even, but all in all, a vast amount of money is spent trying to control or eliminate invasive plant species. And imagine how much money could be saved with better prevention methods. Now let's take a look at some common landscape invasives. And in particular, I'm gonna focus on the plants that the horticulturists brought over from other places in the world. And this list is growing, unfortunately. Plant introductions continue to be problematic when they're done so without caution. And as climate shifts, we're opening up new possibilities for some plants to become established in the wild that previously wouldn't have become so problematic. And so the plants we'll cover here is a brief list of landscape plants plants that were introduced primarily for ornamental purposes in the landscape and how they have spread to the wild. And so these are plants that you should not plant. There are good alternatives out there. I encourage you do not plant any of the following. The first one is crystalline ice plant, Mesembryanthemum crystallinum. This is a type of ice plant, a succulent species. It grows commonly on the coast and it is salt tolerant. It is considered by some to be ornamental and there's speculation it was brought over for those ornamental purposes as part of a succulent garden. 
it has some very interesting characteristics. Um, certainly the, the little bulbs of water on the outside of the plant that make it look like it's covered in ice, ice plant or little crystals uh, are quite interesting. They're unique among plants. You don't see it very often. And many people appreciate the bright red flower buds right before they emerge. And then once the flowers do emerge, there's a showy little flower. However, the crystalline ice plant is one of those plants that can contribute to type conversion by uh, concentrating the salt in the soil and leaving it behind as it decomposes and establishes a change in salinity and soil near the surface, which will inhibit other seeds from germinating. Additionally, it can tend to form dense mats that prevent native plants from spreading and in general is a good one to remove in the landscape. Luckily, this one's fairly easy to remove mechanically. Now let's look at another ice plant, which is much more difficult to remove by hand. This is Carpobrotus edulis. And this one you are probably much more familiar with as a common landscape species. It's a very common ground cover. It's planted in backyards and you often find it growing wild along the coast, right up against the ocean where you're exhibiting coastal salt spray in the air. And it's one that we will encourage you not to plant any more of. We've got plenty of it. One interesting condition on which this plant is commonly grown is on hillsides. There was a time when it was planted on hillsides in order to prevent erosion of the hill because it covers the soil and to help to pr protect your house from fire because that succulent leaf is filled with water and it will not burn. So it seemed like a very functional plant and you don't need to water it. It's perfectly adapted to our climatic conditions. The only problem is on steep enough slopes and with enough time, this plant will tend to begin growing upon layers and layers of dead plant material below. You can in fact see some of that in the image on the bottom, some of that gray mat below the ice plant. That's old ice plant that has dried up and died. And then imagine after a rain, all of the succulent leaves, they swell with moisture because they're absorbing rapidly all of the moisture that they haven't received all summer long. And now you have an excessively wet and heavy plant on top of a dead, dry mat of soil. And what happens? It gets so heavy that it breaks off and actually slides down the hill. So the plant that you once upon a time planted to prevent erosion may actually contribute to worse erosion than if you had done nothing at all. And so we no longer encourage planting this ice plant in and of itself. It does have the ability to spread beyond cultivation. And in the image below, you can see a, a cliff along the ocean covered with ice plant. And imagine all of the native plant species and the ecology, the rich diversity of life that would flourish if it wasn't covered by this thick carpet of ice plant. Once it's here, it's very difficult to remove. So it's best off to not plant any more of it as we make our efforts to uh, control and eliminate the vast majority of invasive ice plant that has escaped cultivation. And now we'll introduce pompous grass, Cortadaria celuana. This is an ornamental grass, very tall, that was introduced from South America as an ornamental in the landscape. Uh, you can even find cultivated varieties that have different color plumes. So you notice the flowers and the seeds, they rise up at the top of that ornamental grass. And look at the image on the left-hand side. You can observe 
how dense a stand of pompous grass can become. That wind dispersed seed travels far and wide and this plant grows quite quickly and is very quick to overtake native species. It's difficult to eliminate by hand because it's, the leaves have a serrated edge that are quite sharp, sawtooth edge. You'll get cuts if you try to walk through this plant. And you can imagine the type of uh, fire susceptibility that all of these fluffy flowers and seeds will bring to a canyon ecosystem, for example. So this is one that we no longer encourage planting in the landscape. And when you see it, you're, you do best to cut it down. And if you can't cut it all the way down, at least cut off the seed heads. Take them inside, put them in a vase, enjoy their beauty, and then uh, dispose of them properly because we want to prevent the seeds from spreading wild in the land. And next up, we have a, a grass that's more recently considered to be invasive. And so you can still find these in the nurseries and in garden centers. But this is one I want to propose as worthy of finding alternatives. This is fountain grass, Penicetum cetaceum. Now, not every form of fountain grass is invasive. However, the vast majority of them are. You can find cultivated varieties with you know, little names in parentheses around them that are red in color. And it turns out that the red leaf penicetum, regardless of the name of the cultivar, do not display the invasive tendencies. But if you're looking for an ornamental grass, a perennial grass that's a bunch grass that grows low and has a nice uh, fluffy seed head display, there are good native plant alternatives such as deer grass that you should consider instead. Take a look at the image on the left hand side. You can see the penicetum growing through the cracks in the sidewalk. And then you take a look over on the right hand side and you can observe penicetum growing in Saguaro National Park in Arizona. And uh, what looks to be like a seasonal stream or a wash. And again, without natural predators, this plant is going to tend to outcompete and has the potential to really damage a sensitive habitat that we would like to preserve. And I'm sorry to say it too, because I agree it's a beautiful plant but we wanna be thinking ecologically when we make our plant selections. And next up, we've got the blue gum, eucalyptus globulus. Here's the, the most invasive of the eucalyptus species. And you can identify it, the blue gum, because look at that light blue color on the left-hand side. And the trunk has a very distinct modeled pattern with striping bark that that peels off. Uh, these trees become massive, dense stands, and the trees themselves become quite tall, almost as tall as our tallest tree on the planet, the, the coastal redwood. And um, these are less of a problem in Southern California. They're more damaging in Northern California, where they get a bit more rainfall. However, in Southern California, they can be problematic as well. I already mentioned the reason is they are they grow so quickly that they dry up the soil ecosystem and they have a fire hazard and they have susceptibility to breaking as well. Some eucalyptus trees are better than others. So there are some species you could plant that wouldn't cause these types of problems. So if you're really looking for eucalyptus, make a proper selection avoid the blue gum. And next up, we've got the Brazilian pepper tree, Shinus terebinthifolia. This is uh, one of two pepper trees that we have growing in California. The Brazilian pepper tree is worse. The Peruvian pepper tree is better, but not much better. Some people call that one California pepper tree. Um, more importantly, avoid Brazilian pepper tree. 
it's easy to identify because of these small red peppercorns. Uh, it's actually not a true pepper, although it has a peppery flavor and it is edible uh, in small quantities. Eat too much and you'll get sick. This has a, a larger leaf than our California pepper, and uh, it tends to grow quite aggressively. When you have a single tree, it looks fine. It's a nice shade tree, evergreen. Um, but in the wild ecosystems, it develops easily from seed that's deposited by birds. So if birds eat these berries and then fly to a canyon and poop them out, you'll have lots of Brazilian pepper trees growing up. And you can imagine that a tree like this would quite quickly grow over our shrublands, shade them out, and then drop enough leaf to really suppress the germination of other plants. What happens is if you cut down one of these trees, you end up with thousands of new sprouts coming up from the roots. And so it's very difficult to kill a Brazilian pepper tree without leaving behind hundreds or thousands of new young pepper trees. It's very resistant to mechanical damage. It was popular in Southern California in the 1950s and 60s when the suburbs were really flourishing. And uh, we don't really see it offered in nurseries too much anymore. You are encouraged not to plant the Brazilian pepper. And most people would encourage you not to plant the California pepper as well. And next up, we've got Phoenix canariensis, the Canary Island date palm. Again, this is another quite beautiful, common landscape palm that people find to be really stunning and attractive, quite iconic characteristic of a San Diego landscape. You can find Canary Island date palms hundreds of feet tall in Balboa Park, and they take centuries to get that tall. And they also have the tendency to spread beyond cultivation with this date-like fruit and become established in the wild, in particular in our riparian ecosystems. Now, currently there is a new weevil, a certain type of insect pest that is present in San Diego that is now going after the date palms, all the different date palm species, including Phoenix canariensis. And what that weevil does is it nests in the very soft new growth up at the crown of the tree, feeds on the new growth and can introduce diseases. Right now there's no control for the weevil. So again, depending on who you talk to, some people think the weevil is a blessing for nature, and other people are worried that the weevil is going to damage your beautiful stately landscape tree and desperately trying to find a cure for the damage caused by the palm weevil. So what's the reality? Probably somewhere in between. And we're seeing currently dieback on Canary Island date palms. If you see a palm tree and the crown is completely dead and all you're left with is a dried up stalk, it's very likely that that tree has succumbed to a palm weevil. Uh, you can still purchase these plants. And in fact, you can sell mature plants. It's a profitable enough business for a nursery to drive out, dig up a giant palm tree, and then resell it to a new landscape. They're really popular in the landscape because they're hardy, first of all, but they can be transplanted as fully mature trees. Most other trees do not transplant well when they're large. So for new construction, when you have a brand new building, you wanna make it look like there's big trees on opening day. You tend to put palm trees in because they grow easily when they're cut and planted in a new place. So that's one of the reasons palms are prolific, but palm trees in Southern California go together in many people's minds going back hundreds of years. And uh, they're kind of the iconic tree of 
Southern California. The irony is there are no native palm trees to coastal San Diego. So Canary Island date palm is one we see quite commonly. It's a beautiful landscape plant. It does have the possibility of escaping cultivation and becoming invasive. And now it's under some predator control and uh, people are trying to bring in a natural enemy of the predator as well. And my recommendation always is not to take a hard dogmatic stance but to look for those areas where we have an opportunity to observe, to learn, and to enhance nature and ecology. And then finally, we'll talk about Washingtonia robusta, the Mexican fan palm. And here we have perhaps the most iconic Southern California palm tree. Um, think of Beverly Hills, think of uh, Venice Beach, the image on the right hand side, the palm trees growing right out of the sand. This tree is not native to San Diego. And the evidence suggests that it was introduced uh, not by Europeans, but by Native Americans who introduced this tree pre colonization as a useful plant. And this tree is very similar in habit to the one true native tree to California, the California fan palm, which grows exclusively in the Southern California desert regions. That tree doesn't grow so well on the coast, but the Mexican fan palm grows very well on the coast with extra humidity in the atmosphere. It grows so well that the image on the left-hand side is a common sight. You get a palm tree growing up right next to and through the cracks in the sidewalk, uh, causing potential problems in the landscape. And so uh, many people encourage you to not plant Mexican fan palms. The Mexican fan palm has uh, established a, a relatively poor reputation these days for hosting rat species and for causing fire hazard and for growing so tall that they become difficult to maintain. I encounter many horticulturists who look at this tree and think it's ugly or use words like trash tree and things like that. Um, I think that's a little bit harsh. It's not the tree's fault what it looks like. And if you call it ugly, that's just your, your interpretation. So I don't hate the tree. But I do recognize that there are some really good alternatives to the Mexican fan palm that give you the exact same look and feel in the landscape without any of the problems. So one example would be the Guadalupe palm, which is native to Mexico as well, but it comes from an island off the coast of Baja, California, much more appropriate for a Southern California climate. It does not grow so tall and become problematic when it's 150 feet high. It is self-cleaning because it sheds the dried fronds naturally, which is generally a preferred aesthetic. So it won't contribute to fire or rat habitat. And it even gives off an edible fruit. Brahia edulis is the scientific name. And it's a good alternative to the Mexican fan palm. So there we go with uh, an explanation of invasive plant species as a subcategory of landscape weeds, as well as an introduction to some of the worst offenders of invasive plant species, in particular those that are introduced and encouraged by ornamental horticulturists. And with an environmental approach, we want to think critically and make proper plant selections so we can have all the same functions and benefits of those plants without the problems. There's plenty of plants out there in the world and we can do a lot of creative work to find the alternatives that are going to truly enhance our local environment.